Are you all thirsty yet? So I was working with my nephew. We were working on uh, putting a roof on our woodshed, and it was hot, and the tar was so sticky on the three tabs. They were sticking where you didn't want them to stick. And, you know, you just keep pushing and pushing to try to get through it, and you're just leaking sweat everywhere. And so finally you go inside and you go, wow, I am thirsty. And when you're really thirsty, you want water. You don't want anything sweet, you want water. And you take a drink of that and you go, oh, in fact, we drank a whole this size glass, just downed it, and you, instead of feeling heavy and like, wow, that was a lot, you know, it's just like your body just absorbs it. And I think what a powerful picture that in John chapter 4, Jesus talks about water. And we relate to that. Water is such a powerful, life-giving force. If you've ever driven across eastern Oregon and you come up over Willamette Pass or one of the passes and you come down into green, it's almost violently green, you know? And what's the difference? Water. That water makes everything grow. Water quenches our thirst. And there's this beautiful picture all the way through the Scripture of God being the, the water of life to us. And the truth is, you realize that there are 90, or 80, 844 million people in the world that don't have access to clear, safe, clean water. In fact, a million people a year die because they're drinking polluted water. And you say, why would people do that? And this is the principle. If you don't have clean, clear, safe water, you will quench your thirst at any mud puddle you can find. And that's just like a gut punch to watch a kid leaning over, drinking muddy water. But the spiritual principle is exactly the same. We are spiritually thirsty. And people who do not have Jesus, the living water, they're drinking out of any mud puddle they can find. They're trying sex and drugs and trying new experiences and relationships and marriages and some of them are trying business and money and luxury and new cars and there's all kinds of places that people are trying to find their life. And if you don't have the water of life, you will drink at whatever mud puddle you find, because we are desperately thirsty. And Jesus uses that picture as we're talking about John chapter 4. I want to read a couple verses to you from the beginning of that chapter. We're going to start there in verse 4. And it talks about Jesus traveling with his disciples, and he says, now he had to go through Samaria. So Jesus lived mostly up in the area around the Galilee, the northern part of Israel. But on several occasions, he traveled down to Jerusalem, which was the, the heart and soul of the Jewish nation, which was where the temple was. And says, he had to go through Samaria. And he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. Significant fa fact there. And when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. We've been talking about what does it mean to be a disciple. And we've came up, come up with this very simple, clear definition. So when we talk about being a disciple, people know what we mean. At least at family church we do. And we talk about, first of all, it's somebody that's following Jesus. And I was impacted last weekend as several people who got baptized said, I was a believer. I didn't know what it meant to be a follower. When you say, are you a believer? People say, well, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe these things. It doesn't mean you've experienced rebirth and life transformation. So it's somebody who's following Jesus, somebody who's in the process of being changed by Jesus. We say that Jesus loves you enough to take you exactly as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you exactly as you are. He's bringing change and transformation and life. And then the third part, which often people miss, is if you're a disciple, it means that you accept the mission of Jesus. We are on mission with Jesus to make living water available to all. And so this picture of the story of this woman is a picture of her 
interacting with Jesus and deciding whether or not she wants to follow him. But the picture also moves to the fact that once you become a disciple, then you have something to offer people who aren't disciples. So here's the map of what I was just talking about. Jerusalem, up, I mean, Galilee up here in this area, Nazareth where Jesus was, lived, many of the disciples lived right around the lake. And you could either go down the highlands, which was following the, the cities all along the Galilean highlands, which is the easiest way to go. And the problem is it goes through Samaria. And the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. You remember we talked about the story of the exile, that when the Babylonians captured Israel, they took people out of there and they took them to Babylon. Well, they did that with other groups too. They brought other people they captured and they brought them into Israel. They figured by switching everybody around, you would sort of lighten up the possibilities of rebellions. And so people came into this area and their picture was, you find out the God of the area and so they learned about Judaism. They learned about the Yahweh who was worshipped there. And then they mixed some of their idol worship and some of their beliefs with the God of the Bible. And so the Jews considered them to be scum, to be heretics, to be people to be avoided. And so some people to avoid them would go all the way along the Jordan River, which was fine, but this is all desert down here. And then there's a several mile huge climb up to Jerusalem. And it said Jesus had to go through Samaria. Well, the reality is he didn't have to, but I think he had a divine appointment there, so he had to, because God had already arranged this appointment. And Jesus is involved in this story, and I want to just paint the back story here. He's exhausted. They've been traveling. It's the middle of the day. He sits down by the well. He's so tired that the disciples go into town without him. And this woman comes to the well. And we know from later in the story that she's been married five times and the guy she's living with now is not her husband. Can you imagine how well that goes over in a religiously conservative small town? She is the outcast. I believe, and many scholars agree, that she's at the well at noon because the women come in the morning and the evening. And she didn't want to deal with all of them gossiping about her and talking behind her back and ignoring her. And so she comes to the well thinking she's going to be alone. And she sees the worst thing imaginable, a Jewish man. Men wouldn't, a Jewish man wouldn't talk to a woman he didn't know anyway, certainly wouldn't talk to a Samaritan woman. And had she known he was a rabbi, she would have assumed, listen carefully, she would have assumed that he would not make eye contact with her, would not even act like she existed, that the two of them would just cooperate around the well, totally ignoring each other. That was her expectation. And Jesus sparked a revival by asking a question, can I have a drink of water? Now you think, how do you start evangelism conversations? Can I have a drink of water? And she looks at him, in the next verse, it describes her reaction here. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Notice how she has a keen grasp of the obvious. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. He said, can I have a drink? And she was startled. She was shocked. She says it like, why are you talking to me? And Jesus begins to unfold to her who he really is. He says, he cares about this thirsty woman. Now, you could put a lot of things in that blank. Sometimes my kids tried to go ahead of me when they were here in church and they tried to say, dad, you made it too easy. We knew all the blanks beforehand. What would you put in that blank? He cared for the sinful woman. He cared for the outcast woman. He cared for the Samaritan woman. You could, you could label her a lot of things, but I think what Jesus saw was a thirsty woman. And listen carefully. You and I have a tendency to label people by the mud puddles they've chosen instead of by the thirst that's part of their heart. 
If we're going to be on mission with Jesus, we need to start seeing people more like Jesus does. And we are so grateful that he sees us as thirsty. But we don't always see others that way. And so he begins to respond to her. He says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Pretty obvious as well. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Isn't that a powerful picture? Life that comes out of this relationship with Christ. Not only will you have the thirst quenched in you, you will have water welling up out of you. And you know one of the reasons it wells up out of us is so that we have something to offer other people as well. You see, you don't become simply a recipient of living water. You become a carafe carrying living water. And he starts talking to her about spiritual things. Does she get it? No, she's like the disciples. She's like, this well is deep. You don't have a bucket. What kind of water are you talking about? And she completely misunderstands. And so he begins to talk to her. And he says, so go call your husband. And she said, "Um, I don't have a husband. So that was technically true, but it was not really the truth, was it? And he said, no, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. (laughs) Can you imagine the awkward pause in the conversation right here? (laughs) I didn't even put this stuff on Facebook. How do you know about me? (laughs) Who have you been talking to? Don't you think that was her first thought? And what he was saying is, I see that you're broken and I see that you've been looking for love in all the wrong places and you've been left thirsty and high and dry and you have no hope. That's what I see. And when she goes back to the village, she tells people, she says, this is the man who told me everything I ever did. Now that's not usually what would endear you to somebody. But obviously Jesus told her what she did in the same understanding that he was the answer to all of that need of her heart. And in fact, if you think about how Jesus is unveiling who he is, he gives one of the most clear and startling statements of who he is to this Samaritan woman at the well. Not only does he mostly focus on the Jewish people, but here's the Samaritan woman who is broken and sinful. And you think, who would you choose to tell the story of the gospel to? And Jesus said, I came not for the healthy, but for those who are sick. So he, a little bit later, says this startling statement to her. The woman says, I know that the Messiah called the Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I, the one who am speaking to you, I am he. You're talking to the Messiah. They understood the Samaritans had also a belief in a Messiah. And Jesus said, that's me. Can you imagine the next shocked silence? This person that she's heard about in her religious studies, and yet all of a sudden he says, that's me. Jesus not only cared about this thirsty person, something happens which is, I think, wonderful. When I'm trying to help you be equipped to share your faith with other people, this is a classic move. He starts getting too close to her toes, and so you know what she does? She tries to start a religious argument. You ever had anybody do this to you? And they bring up something, she says to him, well, you Jews say you should worship in Jerusalem. We say you should worship on Mount Gerizim, so what do you think? Do you think that was the real cry of her heart? Where in geography do we need to worship God? No, actually, Jesus answers her with a powerful statement. He says, God is spirit, and he seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. It isn't about the geography, lady. It's about who God is and how we are to worship him. But she tries to start a religious argument. When you begin to get close to people's spiritual toes, they will start trying to distract you or get you to argue or in some way disengage. And I thought it was so cool. Jesus just kind of handles that question and then he goes on to the core of her heart. He worked through her defenses and everybody who's thirsty has defenses. And he begins to talk to her, not about where you worship, but about how you worship and who you worship. And he brought the discussion back to who it is that we're talking about. 
And he worked through her defenses, and then she was willing to listen and to change. She responded, and she then not only believes in who he is, but then she goes and she begins to tell those who are in her village. She takes that living water that Jesus gives her. She believes in him. And then she responds by being on mission with him. And uh, several months ago, we introduced to you a new word. It's called kintsuki. And it is a Japanese art where the pottery that is broken is healed, restored with gold in the cracks. So that what is finished product is more beautiful than what the original was because of its brokenness. And you know, you think, would you choose this woman to be your spokesperson? But when somebody who's been broken is healed, there is such power in that. And we're going to share a story with you, a very special story of a a woman in our congregation who's been broken and healed. And she's going to come and tell you about what God has taken her through and how, like the woman at the well, he saw her as thirsty. And so I'd like you to welcome Rochelle Olson is going to come and share what God has done. (laughs) And what God is still doing, right? Yes. (laughs) All right. Share your story, would you? Well, hello, everybody. You probably recognize me from pretty close to here, but I'm usually singing and worshiping the Lord. um, But now you get to find out why I just love God so much. Um, So when I was growing up, my family didn't have uh, much of a relationship with God at all. We went to Catholic Church long enough to uh, go through confirmation and get the pretty pictures and the rosary. We checked that off the list, and we pretty much never went again. So then I continued growing up, and my parents kind of became fairly, like, unavailable emotionally, and so my sinful tendencies were just left to fester and grow. Um, So... I became really confused and rebellious and angry, and one could say I was thirsty. (laughs) So I started drinking from the mud puddle. By 15, I was um, smoking cigarettes. Uh, I was addicted to pills. By 16, I was pregnant. And um, I got the advice that I'm sure most 16-year-olds that get pregnant get. There's only one real piece of advice you get, get an abortion. And um, I said, no. I said, I'm not going to take the life of my child. And so I had Shara. There she is. (laughs) She was a challenge and a pleasure. And now today we have Shara. And she's been... um, involved in VBXs. She's served um, at high school camps and middle school camps. She's been on a mission trip to Mexico, and she's a wonderful part of our life now. Um, But unfortunately, that's not where my story ends. There should be another amazing 16-year-old with us today. But a year and a half or so after I had Shara, I was addicted to something worse than pills. I was addicted to meth. I had already tried to shake it, and I could never quit for more than a couple weeks. And so when I found out I was pregnant, I realized I wasn't going to be able to stop. What kind of life would this child have? I got the same advice I had gotten the last time. There's only one option. And this time I listened. Um, I thought I'd convinced myself that it was the right thing to do, that I was going to save this child from a miserable life, you know, um, that I had damaged it, that no one else would be able to take, would want to take care of it, and that I wouldn't be able to. So I made the appointment. I showed up at the Planned Pregnancy Center um, in my town, and I was four months pregnant already by the time I got there because I had tried to ignore the truth for so long, hoping it would just go away. And um, 
because I was so far along, I had to make an appointment at a town an hour and a half away from my home to get it done. And I remember looking at the lady behind the glass who was scheduling the appointment on the computer, just like it was my next hair appointment or, you know, the next round of vaccinations for my kid. And, but the difference was she wouldn't look at me. And I just, I knew it was wrong. I knew it was wrong, but I felt so control, out of control. So I showed up at that town an hour and a half away and the night before the appointment with my boyfriend. We stayed in a motel, and it was one of the worst nights in my life. Um, I was just full of dread over what would happen the next day, and there wasn't enough drugs in the world to cover up that awful feeling. So I showed up the next morning at the clinic, and my father was there, um, and I felt some comfort there. He was there to support me. That was nice. And then I got checked in, um, and then the next thing I remember, I was laying on the table, and they were doing the ultrasound. Well, I had had a baby. I knew what was on that screen. They had it pointed away from me. And I asked, can I, can I see? And the lady pulled it tighter and said, no, no, you can't see. And I told her, I don't, I don't think I can do this. And she said, no, nope, it's too late now. The doctor's here, you're here, we're just gonna go ahead and get this done. And I just felt so helpless. So I stayed. I think often that I should have just run away right then, just run anywhere, but I didn't. I stayed. They had to put me to sleep for the procedure, and um, the next thing I remember, I woke up on a stainless steel table in a big room, and there was nobody there, just stainless steel cabinets, stainless steel tools, and just white. And I came out of that room and went to the lobby and my father was gone. My boyfriend was gone. I was alone. And so I just went to the parking lot and I sat on a curb and just wept. Eventually, my boyfriend did show back up, and um, he called around and found someone to come all the way out and pick us up and bring us back home. But from then on, my life continued to just spiral out of control. I had not only my confusion and anger and rebellion, now I had this terrible guilt and shame. Um, so my drug addiction just continued. And one night, in the middle of all of that, I had gained this kind of sense that God was going to use this, that it was going to be okay. And I didn't know who he was, but I, I wanted to know. And so one night I prayed to him, and I asked him for righteousness. I was high at the time. I didn't know what righteousness was. I didn't know who God was. But yet, he cared, and he listened, and he answered that prayer. Not long after that, I had turned myself in because I had drug charges, and I wanted to get right. So I had turned myself in, and I was in jail. <clears throat> and... Um, I'd been in there 12 days, right about at that two-week mark that I couldn't make it past with my addiction. And I showed up at court thinking I was going to get out and I was going to do the right thing. But in the back of my mind, I thought, I, I probably need to go tell my friends that I'm back in town. I probably should go say hi. And knowing but ignoring what that would mean, that I was going to get into trouble. Well, the judge asked me, where are you going to be staying? And I said, well, 
my mother won't take me back, so I'll stay at the homeless shelter. And he said, no, you're not. <laughs> I'm going to put you back in jail for a couple of days and until I can figure out where we're going to put you. And I just got mad. <laughs> I ended up throwing a fit the rest of that day like a two-year-old that didn't get that piece of candy. Um, I was just so angry. And so um, I just stirred in that from the moment he said that until at night after everybody else was asleep. And it was all dark and quiet. And I was just fuming. And then it was like all of a sudden I felt this heavy rush of quiet. And all of that fuming just kind of stopped. And I, I just felt the presence of God. And he said, that was me. I did that. I knew what you were going to do. I'm not going to let you do it. And now's the time to just come to me. And I, I knew it. I knew that was true. I acknowledged what I was going to do. And I, I didn't want to do it anymore. I wanted to stop desperately, and I couldn't. So I said, okay. Just, and I just gave, I gave my life to him right there. Um, and I haven't touched it again. I've been clean for well over a decade now. <laughs> yeah, 100 percent by the grace of God. So shortly after that, um, I met my husband now, and uh, he knew my story. I told him my story, and he goes, "Hey, I know, I know where you need to go." And he brought me to church. And um, I heard about Jesus, and I said, oh my gosh, that's the guy. I recognized him. I know him. That's the one that came to me. Fantastic. So I just dove right in, started reading the Bible, going to church, started worshiping on, you know, with the, on stage and everything, and just loved it, full of joy. Um, but during that kind of first several months, I kind of had to come to terms with that awful decision I had made. God could forgive me for drug addiction, and God could forgive me for my promiscuity and all the mistakes I had made, but, but this one seemed really, really bad, and I wasn't sure that he could forgive me for this one. So I'm a researcher at heart. I had to find out. And now I had a place to find out. I had my answers in the Bible. So I just read and looked. Where was it? Can he forgive me for this or can he not? Am I done? And um, I found verses like Matthew 5, 21 through 22, where Jesus says, You've heard it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders is subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. So he's likening Jesus himself, you know, me saying, you fool, which I know God forgives me for, to a murderer, that, that we get the same punishment. So I thought, he must be able to forgive me for this too, then. That's what I felt like. And then I found verses like Psalm 65.3, awesome verse. It says, though we are overwhelmed by our sins, you forgive them all, everyone. And so I knew it was true. And so I was free again. <laughs> so not only was I free from my drug addiction and my sinful life, and now I was free from guilt and shame, and I knew I was forgiven, and I could really start over. But I was never free from my loss. I miss my child all the time. So fast forward about 10 years later, and I'm here. <laughs> and um, I heard about the Surrendering the Secret class, which is our post-abortion healing class. And I thought, well, I don't think I really need that. I think God and I have dealt with that. Um, so I'm OK, you know? And um, then around the turn of the year this year, 
the abortion debate came out really loud. I don't know if you all remember the whole New York issue and everybody started talking. And there wasn't one woman that had had an abortion anywhere in the discussion. It was a bunch of people talking about something they really didn't know about. You know, and everybody just fighting and not, not one person saying the things that I should have heard that I wish I would have heard before I made that choice. Like, you will be full of regret. You will miss your child. You will grieve forever over the loss of this child. That, that that child exists whether you like it or not and you will have to come to terms with that at some point. Nobody told me that. So I just got really mad and I felt like I had to do something. I was so frustrated. And so I prayed to God, you know, where, what am I supposed to do with all of this? Like, where am I supposed to go? And then I went to a women's gathering and up comes Susan Hillman talking about surrendering the secret class again. And I thought, is this it? <laughs> Am I supposed to do that? And um, talked to Susan and um, prayed and decided to do the class. So there were, um, there were a few highlights. It was, really, um, it was really comforting to hear the other ladies' stories and just feel like that kind of belonging and comfort that you get from somebody that shares the same hurt that you have had. And then um, also through the process, God led me to name my son Samuel, which was really like, just felt really good. And, um, and then also just this sense of peace and closure, getting to celebrate the life of my son. Um, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank Susan Hellman and Darlene Handy. I think one of them is here. <laughs> so thank you, Susan and Darlene. I know um, it takes a lot of patient dedication to keep going with this class and helping those of us who have this deep, deep hurt to help us heal. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I think you can see on their faces how much this means. I can't tell you how much I admire you for not only going through this and letting God work in you, but sharing so bravely about what the process is and what a powerful message. And we're going to hand off to the Green Campus and the South Umpqua, and they're going to go ahead and finish the service uh, at their own campus. And we have a treat for you. Um, Rochelle has a beautiful voice, and as a part of this healing process, there was a song on the radio that she began to really resonate with of somebody who had had a similar experience, and she's going to share that with us now. And so just enjoy and let what she's already shared um, sink in as she shares this song. <laughs> Too many. Too many wires. Hey Lucy, I remember your name I left a dozen roses on your grave today I'm in the grass on my knees, wipe the leaves away I just came to talk for a while, I've got some things I need to say now that it's over, I just want to hold her. I'd give up all the world to see that little piece of heaven looking back at me. Now that it's over, I just want to hold her. I've got to live with the choices I made, and I can't live with myself today. Hey Lucy, I remembered your birthday They said it brings some closure to say your name 
I know I'd do it all different if I had the chance But all I've got are these roses to give And they can't help me make amends Now that it's over I just want to hold her I'd give up all the world to see a little piece of heaven looking back at me now that it's over i just wanna hold her i've gotta live with the choices i made and i can't live with myself today here we are now you're in my arms i never wanted anything so bad here we are for a brand new start living the life that we could have had me and lucy walking hand in hand me and lucy never want to end just another moment in your eyes i'll see you in another life in heaven where we never say goodbye i just want to hold her i give up all a little piece of heaven looking back at me now that it's over i just wanna hold her i've gotta live with the choices i made and i can't live with myself today here we are now you're in my arms here we are for a brand new start i've gotta live with the choices i made and i can't live with myself today me and lucy walking hand in hand me and lucy never want to end i've got to live with the choices i made and i can't live with myself today hey lucy i remember your We admire you. We praise God with you. Would you join me in a word of prayer? God, thank you for your business of changing hearts and changing lives. Thank you that it's not something that just happened 2,000 years ago. It's something you're doing every day. And God, thank you for the story of Rochelle's past, but thank you so much for her present and the way that you're now using her to lift our hearts and to impact other people. And God, I pray if there's anybody here who's struggling under that shame and that guilt of an abortion or of anything else, that, God, they would find their way to you, that you would give them the righteousness where it's the only place it comes from, and that, God, you would help us to share the message of hope with people who are thirsty and who are lost. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Michelle. Wow, huh? I saw you grabbing Kleenex. I want to bring out another point out of this because most of you didn't know Rochelle's backstory. You know her present story. And the beautiful part is that God uses wounded healers. And so we look back at the, the story of the Samaritan woman. And continuing of this life change happens as our lives are changed and then we have a chance to point people to Jesus. And so, Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman. She runs off to Samaria, or to Sychar, and then the disciples come back, and they say, it says, nobody wanted to ask him, why are you talking to that woman? It was clearly all over their faces, but nobody wanted to say it. And then they offer him lunch, and Jesus has this very strange answer. He says, no, thank you. Remember, he's tired and hungry. And then he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. 
the work that God's been doing since creation to call people to himself. It says, don't you have a saying, it's still four months until the harvest? Like, that's a procrastinator statement. Oh yeah, it'll happen, but it's still a ways away. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. You know what You know what Jesus is saying? There's thirsty people everywhere. Everywhere you look, there are thirsty people. And they are often identified with the mud puddles they've chosen. But the deeper underlying part is that they're thirsty. And we as a church have been focusing on this simple statement that we are people helping people find and follow Jesus. And I think it's easy for us to say, well, those are pastor kind of people or leader kind of people or people that can sing or people that can talk. Those those are not me kind of people. And I often hear people say, well, I don't think I know enough. I don't have enough experience. I haven't grown enough in my Christian life. Let me just ask you this question. How long had the Samaritan woman known Jesus? About a half hour? Maybe an hour? And what does she do? She goes back into her town where she was immensely popular. And she says, not how qualified she is, she said, I want you to meet the one who has told me everything I've ever done. And don't you think the people in the town could tell quite a few things that she had done? And she said it with a different way. I think he's the Messiah, she said. I think he's the Messiah. You see, it wasn't about the qualifications of the messenger. It was about the quality of the message. Because you see, when Jesus gives us living water, he not only gives us a drink of water, he gives us a carafe. So that you now have a well of water. It says welling up inside of you. So you have something to offer, not because you're anything special, but because he's everything special. And you see, it doesn't take a doctorate in theology. It doesn't take your perfect lifestyle. It simply takes somebody who's had living water that can tell somebody else. And you know what happens? They come running back to Jesus, and they listen to Jesus, and then they say this, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. So, so recap this story. There's a revival in this town of mixed religion called Sychar because Jesus said, are you thirsty? Or said, give me a drink. And then the woman said, let me go tell you about the person that I have found that has given me the answers I needed, that has fulfilled my thirst. And so we are talking about people helping people find and follow Jesus. And I think it's easy for you to say, that's other people. And so what I want you to do is, there's a blank right there. I want you to write your name in that blank. I want to get you past the fact that this is other people helping people. And I want you to say, if I'm on mission with Jesus then I need to help people. Even in the story of Rochelle, she came to life understanding in that prison cell, but it was her husband-to-be that took her to church, and then she could get encouraged and grow, and, and her life could be nurtured. He was helping people find and follow Jesus and look at the result. So, a couple of quick next step questions. I think this is such a simple question, but so profound. Do you really care about people? I don't mean in the abstract. I mean, do you care about the people in your life? The people that live next to you, the people that go to school with you, the people you work with, the people that are in your family? Those are sometimes the hardest. And if you care about them, wouldn't you want them to have living water? And so I want to challenge you this week to begin praying for an opportunity I want you to say, God, I am ready and I'm willing. I'm looking to spark a spiritual conversation. Some of us have hardly any contact with unbelievers. But you know what's interesting, especially living in a small town? Every time you go to a store, every time you go to the gas station, every time you you interact with people, you have a chance to build a relationship or just treat them like a servant. And if you begin to build relationships and if you then ask that spark question that says, uh, can I have a drink of water? I believe that God can do more through you than you believe he can. And it's not because we are so qualified, it's because he is. So I want you to think, God, if you give me a chance this week, I will speak up for you. And then you ask the Holy Spirit to give you a swift kick when you get to that moment so you don't chicken out. 
We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So... If you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.